Moses, my servant, by H. Tennant, Chapter 8, Part 2. By altar and burnt offering, Balak tried to work with Balaam in producing the right atmosphere in which Balaam could speak a word to Balak's favour. This was in vain. Before the princes of Moab and their king, the cursing of Balaam was uttered. Quote, how shall I curse whom God hath not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord hath not defied? Lo, the people shall dwell alone, and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob, or number the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my last end be like his. Unquote. So this was the curse. Understandably, Balak was angry and distressed. They moved to another place from which Balak hoped it would be possible to curse the people of God. The result was equally dismal for Moab, but startlingly, start, startlingly beautiful and significant for Israel. Quote, Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion, and lift himself up as a young lion. Unquote. Vexed and distraught, the king of Moab brought Balaam to a final place. Here the prophet abandoned every pretense of seeking enchantments on behalf of Israel's enemies. In a prophecy filled with powerful language and strangely sad so far as the prophet himself was concerned, the words of the Spirit of God were uttered, quote, How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel, as the trees of lime aloes which the Lord hath planted, and as cedar trees beside the waters. Blessed is he that blesseth thee, and cursed is he that cursed thee. Unquote. Here were the words of God taking up the threads of the promises made to Abraham and seeing in the great camp of the waiting nation the growing of the seed that, of that faithful man. There was a magnificence about the straight lines of the pitch tents of Israel. Balak was afraid. Now he smote his hands together in anger and despair. Balaam was helpless. The spirit of the Lord had seized him as of old and despite his first intent to come and take the wages of unrighteousness by speaking enchantments against Israel, he was now altogether and solely a prophet on their behalf. Without further waiting, and saying, quote, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord to do either good or bad of mine own hand, unquote, this strange, unwilling and unfaithful prophet spoke of the forthcoming victories of Israel, and with uncanny picturesqueness of the speech sent forth, of speech sent forth hints of Messiah and Balaam's own remoteness from him. Quote, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come forth a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Unquote. Thus ended the words of this hired prophet with Israel undisturbed on the plain below, while, quote, Balaam rose up and went and returned to his place and Balak also went his way." Unquote. Whether Israel had sen seen the distant altars of Balak and Balaam, we're not told. Moses learned of the thwarted intentions of Moab and rested content in his God. But there were other ways of causing Israel to weaken in their purposes against Moab. Centuries before, the men of Shechem had tried to make league with the sons of Jacob and to secure an alliance by marriages with a view to swallowing up the wealth of the family of God those purposes failed, though they almost succeeded through the falling way of Dina, Jacob's daughter. It was now the turn of Moab to try similar tactics. The enticements had two main constituents, the daughters of Moab and the god of Moab. The men of Israel fell into the tempting trap. The strange women led them to the strange god of Peor. The god which had been unable to help Balak by sign or enchantment was a powerful ally in the matter of yoking Israel to his ways and to his women. The chief men of Israel were among the offenders. It would appear that those who engaged in these things stole away from the camp of God and practiced their wantonness and idolatry over the neighboring border of Moab. Moses soon heard of the extent of the trouble because the Lord's anger and plague were felt in the camp. The chief men were slain and their heads displayed for all to see. This was a shocking sight, but no more so than the waywardness of the nation in the eyes of God. So brazen were some of the people that one man walked openly into the camp with his newfound Midianitish lover, 
and he did so at the very moment when Israel had gathered together at the door of the tabernacle, weeping because of the plague and the punishment of the chiefs. Phineas, the grandson of Aaron, followed with his spear and slew in intent the pair who were a blot on Israel's face. Thus was the plague stayed, and Israel licked her wounds once more. The offending man and woman were among the nobility of their respective societies. The zeal of Phineas was rewarded. God made a covenant with him to bless him and his seed in the priesthood. The extent of the idolatry of Israel is described in the Psalms, quote, They joined themselves unto Baal Peor and ate the sacrifices of the dead, unquote. This was the depth of their fall. Sacrifices and grievous practices, together with the woman of, women of the land, had led them away from the righteousness and purity of God. They had passed from the living God and were seeking to the dead. In these things there is a terrible warning. The border which lies between ourselves and life outside holds many temptations. We are not likely to be ensnared if our eyes are inward, toward the camp, toward the tabernacle and its holiness. If our God gaze turns away and roves over the pleasures and allurements of the nations around, we shall soon find opportunity to stray over the frontier, to fellowship in the arms of death. There is no enchantment or purpose which can prosper, us against, against, prosper against us if we remain with our God. There is no telling the powers and dangers which will take us if we turn aside our hearts from their resting place in God. It was many years since Moses had numbered the people, in fact, at the beginning of the wilderness experiences. The time had come to take count once more. This was done by Eliezer to the com at the command of God. There was a double purpose in this census. This was an enrollment for the purposes of inheritance of the land. Quote, Unto these shall the land be divided for an, for an inheritance according to the number of the names. Unquote. The numbering served also to teach the, of the greatness and minuteness of the fulfillment, fulfillment of God's word. Quote, but among these there was not a man of them who Moses and Aaron the priest numbered, when they numbered the children of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. For the Lord had said of them, They shall surely die in the wilderness. And there was not left a man of them, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. Unquote. Not a man. All the generation passed away. A great multitude. Not one man had been missed. None had escaped the judgment. The work was complete. It was now time to move onwards. The time for the new nation to cease its journeyings and come to rest in the land promised to their fathers. There was, however, one man too many. That man was Moses. Quote, and the Lord said unto Moses, Get thee up into this mountain of Abiram, and see the land. And when thou hast seen it, thou shalt also be gathered unto thy people, as Aaron thy brother was gathered. Unquote. This was the solemn preparatory warning. How would Moses receive it? Would this pronouncement break him down? Would he fall beneath this blow against his own person and life? There was a lifetime's prayer and self-sacrifice behind him. Therefore, this time too was turned into prayer, a prayer of self-effacement. Quote, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, which may go out before them, and which may go in before them, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. Unquote. This was the cry of the shepherd. There was no selfish voice even in this moment of extremity, only an earnest seeking for the welfare of God's people, the nation for whom 120 years of living had been offered up in service. We might take up the prayer of Balaam, which, when we consider Moses' attitude to death, and say, quote, Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my last end be like his. Unquote. The Lord, who had heard Moses in every situation throughout his long life, was not tardy in replying to this wholesome request. Moses was commanded to install Joshua. It is an instructive moment. The partnership which had existed between Moses and Aaron was to be continued between Joshua and Eleazar. There was, however, to be a difference. The Lord would give counsel to Joshua through the Urim at the inquiry of Eleazar. In a ceremony before all congregation, Moses laid his hands upon Joshua, conferring honour and blessing on him. 
giving him a charge before God to keep his word and be strong. Joshua was thus equipped. The Spirit of the Lord had been upon him from the days when the Spirit was poured out upon the elders. He was now the successor to the greatest leader Israel had ever had until the days of Jesus, the Son of God. There were one or two other matters which Moses had to attend to. At the command of God, he reminded Israel of her obligations concerning the daily burnt offering, the special offerings of the Sabbath, the new moon, the Passover, and the day of first fruits. Special emphasis was laid upon the perfect month, the seventh, which from the first appearing of the new moon through the solemnities of the Day of Atonement to the Feast of Tabernacles spoke of the grace of God. One by one, Moses renewed these joyous obligations and reminded Israel of her vows. On account of the evil which the Midianites had occasioned to Israel, the Lord commanded war against them. It was to be a symbolic battle as well as a real one. Only 12,000 men were called up from the camp of Israel, a thousand from, the tribe with, from a tribe with Phineas sounding a silver trumpet. The outcome of the battle was never in doubt. The Midianites were defeated, the Lord was avenged, and a great spoil was returned to the camp, and among it Midianitish women as captives. Moses was angry and feared lest the havoc brought about by their earlier contact with the Midian should be repeated. Therefore, on return from this battle, everything was cleansed and only the maidens of Midian were allowed to live. When the count of the soldiers was taken, it was discovered that not one man of them had died and they brought their offerings of thankfulness to the Lord. This was to be a pattern of their campaigns when they entered the land. Such things as were commanded to be destroyed must be destroyed, not for wantonness or barbarity, but, for, but because the nations being removed had offended against God by their wickedness and idolatry, and the uncleanness must not be allowed to touch the people of God. The command of Moses was clear, quote, Destroy all their pictures, destroy all their molten images, and quite, <coughs> and quite pluck down all their high places. But if you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land, they shall be as pricks in your eyes and as thorns in your sides, and they shall vex you in the land wherein you dwell. Unquote. Thus Moses prepared the people for his departure and for theirs. The borders of the land were defined, the princes to supervise the division of the land selected, the cities of the Levites were explained, and the six cities of refuge appointed. Nothing was left to chance. There was to be order and reason underlying their establishment in the Holy Land. The order was to be God's pattern, and the reasons had their roots in the worship, which was to be at the heart, beat at the heart of the new kingdom, with the God of heaven as its king. Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh asked for their inheritance on the far side of the Jordan, because the people and cattle were many, and because the land was well suited to them. Moses upbraided them with cowardice and laziness in seeking settlement before their brethren had fought for theirs. Whether or not it was this which produced the answer they gave, or whether they had determined it before in their hearts, we do not know. However, the men of war said that they would go over and fight beside their brethren when the time came, and then return to their own inheritance. It is to their credit that they did. There was, of course, more to the anxiety of Moses than the mere inheritance in this place or that. He had spent his lifetime in trying to make them one flock before God. He had sought to inculcate a spirit of fellowship. It was this spirit which had to be preserved, otherwise Israel would disintegrate rapidly and lose her uniqueness. They were the body of Moses, and he was anxious that after his decease they should continue to feel for one another and to attain to a nationhood before God. Their unity sprang from the unity of God. They had no king who was visible to them on great occasions. They were bound together by invisible ties whose strength was the strength of the God of Israel. Moses knew this and he hoped that in some measure his children would learn the value of their national structure founded upon the rock of Israel. He was now ready to give his final exhortations, the great rehearsal of the grace of God toward Israel. In the plains of Moab by Jordan near Jericho, he called the people together to take leave of them. 